Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm Maren Sahami, the Associate Chair for Education at Stanford University's Computer Science Department, a member of the ACM and past chair of ACM's Education Board. Previously, I was a senior research scientist at Google. For those who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, here's some more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see more of some of these highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in deriving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the digital library and the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing Award, and the ACM Prize in Computing Award, and the newly updated ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM enables its, member, its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enrich our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will see some additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows or Command-R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. If you have questions during this talk, please type them into the Q&A box at any time and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Jan speaks, and he'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our Tech Talks. You may also open the link to the survey at any time from the Resources window on your screen. You can use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag #ACMLearning. We'll be watching for your tweets. We also have a new community discourse page to continue the discussion after this webcast, including questions we won't be able to get through during the Q&A session. Today's presentation is The Power and Limits of Deep Learning by Jan LeCun. Jan LeCun is VP and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook and Silver Professor at NYU affiliated with the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Center for Data Science. He was the founding director of Facebook AI Research and of the NYU Center for Data Science. He received an engineering diploma from ESIEE in Paris and a PhD from Sorbonne University. After a postdoc in Toronto, he joined AT&T Bell Labs in 1988 and AT&T Labs in 1996 as head of image processing research. He joined NYU as a professor in 2003 and Facebook in 2013. His interests, include, his interests include AI, machine learning, computer perception, robotics, and computational neuroscience. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the recipient of the 2018 ACM Turing Award with Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Bengio for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep learning networks or deep neural networks a critical component of computing. Jan is also a member of the ACM. Jan, without further ado, please take it away. All right, thank you, Marin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm hoping to uh, rush through my talk quickly enough to have enough time for questions because I'm sure that's an important part. Um, all right, hopefully you're seeing my slides. Uh, the power of limits of, of deep learning. So I'm going to uh, explain really, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are quite aware of what deep learning really is, but um, I'm going to uh, not assume that and uh, explain some of the basics and then go through the state of the arts, go through the limitations of current techniques, 
and then sort of give 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 a, a few ideas about topics that people are working on today to try to lift those limitations and kind of go beyond the limitations of current systems. So uh, deep learning today, or AI today, really, um, the, the new AI, if you want, um, is, is based on deep learning. And it's uh, almost entirely based on supervised learning. So supervised learning is the idea by which you train a machine by showing it examples. So for example, you want to train a machine to distinguish images of cars from images of airplanes. You show it an example of a car. If it says car, you do nothing. If it doesn't say car, you adjust the internal parameters of that machine so that which is a program, of course, so that the output gets closer to the one you want. Um, and by uh, having a sophisticated enough uh, model or machine uh, with enough parameters in it and the appropriate architecture, and by showing it enough samples, um, the, the, the system will not only recognize uh, samples you've trained it on, but will also kind of abstract the notion of car and airplane and will be able to recognize any car and any airplane or most of them. So this works, this is extremely successful for areas where data is available or data is easily collected. So things like speech recognition, translating speech into words, uh, recognizing images, basically classifying images into categories, or even picking out objects in images as, as we'll see. Face recognition, generating captions, uh, translating a text from one language to another, figuring out what the topic of a text is, things like that. So this works great uh, as long as you have enough data and you have have enough resources to collect that data and label it. Um, and really, the source of it goes back to the 50s with uh, uh, what's, what's known as the, the perceptron model, which is based on this idea that uh, perhaps we should get a little bit of inspiration from the brain in the sense that uh, the brain is a large network of interconnected neurons, each of which is relatively simple and can be seen in a highly simplified form of comp as computing a weighted sum of its inputs and in which learning takes place by modifying the connections between the neurons. So back in the old days, uh, these were analog computers. Uh, now uh, we re replace the spaghetti plate of wires by spaghetti code, but uh, things are somewhat similar, uh, a lot simpler. You can replace this whole widget by uh, you know, a few lines of Python today. Now, uh, that model of the perceptron is based on the idea that you have some sort of feature extractor that will uh, turn the raw data into a sort of digestible form that will extract relevant uh, information about the image or whatever it is that you are trying to, to uh, analyze or recognize or classify. And then you will plug a relatively simple classifier. Uh, in the days of Perceptron, it was uh, you know, what we would now call a single layer neural net. And the idea of neural nets, multi-layer neural nets, and deep learning is nothing more than the idea that you will stack multiple layers of, of neural nets. And, or, or other type of parameterized uh, differentiable function. And you will train the entire system end to end. And the reason for having multiple layers um, is, is, is the fact that uh, the, the, the perceptual world is essentially compositional. So um, objects are made of parts and parts are made of uh, subparts and those subparts are made of motifs and the motifs are made of uh, combinations of edges in an image, for example, and edges are made of pixels. So you have this, this compositional hierarchy and what you want is some multi-layer architecture that at every level sort of detects the, the relevant features. You know, you, you want to recognize a car, it's probably a good idea to have something that detects a kind of a round shape to uh, be able to tell if there's a, a wheel or something like that. So that, that's really, it's called deep learning just because there are multiple layers, it's as simple as that. So now the, the trick is, um, uh, how do we train those, uh, those systems? Uh, and I'll come to this in a minute. So uh, supervised learning is not the only approach. Uh, another possible approach is reinforcement learning. And of course, there's been a lot of uh, uh, noise around reinforcement le learning over the last uh, five, six years or so, um, um, you know, for, for work from, from various people, you know, uh, pioneered by uh, Rich Sutton and Andy Barto in the early 1980s and more recently by, by people at DeepMind and other places. And uh, reinforcement learning is, um, is fascinating because you don't need to tell the machine what the correct answer is, unlike uh, supervised learning. But in the current form of uh, the current approaches to reinforcement learning at least, uh, except uh, a, small number, a small number of recent work, the, the learning is extremely slow in the sense that the system needs to interact many, many times with the environment to, to learn anything, even things that are relatively simple. So 
uh, you want to train a neural net, uh, a, um, a deep neural net, for example, to play Atari games, you have it watch the, the screen and uh, play many, many games, and it kind of figures out which action to take to maximize its score. Uh, but it takes it roughly with the best algorithm currently, takes it about 80 hours to reach the performance that any human can reach in about 15 minutes. It gets better after that. It gets better than the humans, but it takes very, very long. Um, uh, similar, similarly, if you want to train a system to play Go, um, uh, there is a system produced by Facebook AI Research called Alpha Open Go. Um, it has to play about 20 million self-play games. That takes about two weeks on 2,000 GPUs. So it's not, it's not cheap. Uh, the StarCraft uh, Alpha Star system that DeepMind uh, recently unveiled took the equivalent of 200 years of real-time play uh, to kind of reach uh, good performance uh, on a single map using a single uh, type of player. Um, so they, the, all those systems use kind of uh, uh, sort of you know, regular deep learning machinery with sort of objectives and algorithms that use, uh, uh, that are based on reinforcement learning. So the problem with this is that it's kind of impractical to use if you want to, for example, train a robot to grasp objects or if you want to train a car to drive itself. It, the, the car would have to drive uh, perhaps millions of hours and may have to uh, crash into a cliff, fall off a cliff uh, several thousand times before it figures out how to not to do that. That's because it doesn't really have a model of the world. It needs to really try something to see what the effect is. And so what we're going to see is that it's one of the limitations of current approaches to AI, and 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 uh, we'll see possible approaches to to lift this. And a lot of people are working on this at the moment. So what is a, a, a deep neural net or a deep multilayer neural net? Um, it's really uh, uh, the, the, in the simplest form, it's a, uh, uh, a, a, a sandwich or a, a, a Napoleon, if you're interested in cakes, um, uh, of alternated modules. Uh, uh, one type of module are linear modules. So basically, you think of the input as being a vector. The first layer will take that vector, multiply it by matrix, and produce another vector. Um, and then the second type of layer is pointwise nonlinear functions. The most popular ones at the moment in the neural net uh, literature are called ReLUs, and they basically have forever rectifiers. So they, they're equal to the identity function where the argument is positive uh, and equal to zero when the argument is negative, as shown on the upper right here. Um, so then you repeat the process, a linear function followed by a pointwise nonlinearity followed by a linear function, et cetera. And uh, there are theorems that show that if you have two layers of those, so linear, nonlinear, linear, you can approximate any function you want as close as you want as long as the middle, middle layer is big enough. Uh, but in fact, if you want to represent complex functions, uh, you need more than just two layers. Um, and you get a chance that the network that is required to solve a particular problem would be a lot smaller than if you only go with two layers. So that's kind of the motivation for deep learning, is the fact that there's a lot of functions that we want to learn that basically are easy to compute or simpler to compute with many layers than they would with uh, only two. Um, how are we going to train this? We're going to train this, uh, let's say, in the case of supervised learning, but it's very similar in, uh, in other uh, paradigms. There's an obje objective function you want to minimize, which is uh, a measure of discrepancy between the output you get and the output you want, for example. Uh, in supervised learning, that would be the case. And you measure the average of this over a training set, and you want to adjust the internal parameters, which are the weights in the matrices, the coefficients in the matrices that we saw earlier. Uh, so that the uh, average objective function over a set of training samples is minimized. And we're going to minimize this with what's called stochastic gradient. Uh, it seems complicated, but it's very simple. Basically, you take one sample, you compute the gradient of the objective function on the basis of the single sample, and you make an update of the parameters, and then you repeat with the next sample. And if you do this, the system will, on average, minimize the average objective function, even though you never actually compute it. Uh, in practice, because of reasons of parallelization and limitation of our hardware, we actually don't uh, process a single sample at a time, usually a mini batch of samples, typically something like 3,600, something like this. The more you want to parallelize, the bigger your mini batch has to be, and that has actually some uh, uh, bad side effects. Um, Okay, so then the next thing is that you need to figure out in which direction and by how much to tweak all the parameters, all the coefficients in all the matrices so that the costs go down. And that's done by just simply computing the gradient of the cost with respect to all the parameters in the system, which is, so the gradient is a vector of all the partial derivatives of the cost with respect to all the, the, all the coefficients in all the matrices. 
And uh, it turns out you can do this through a technique that in other domain is known as automatic differentiation. Um, but in the context of neural nets is, uh, or, 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 or deep learning, it's called backpropagation. It's, a, it's nothing more than a practical application of chain rule. Uh, it's become popular uh, in, in, the, in the domain since the late 80s, even though the principle kind of existed much, uh, uh, much before that, uh, but never was really applied to the, the, the problem of machine learning. Uh, so there is this backward process and current um, uh, where, where gradients are backpropagated forwards in the system, uh, which is just an application of chain rule, as I was saying earlier. You don't actually have to um, uh, kind of do this yourself if you want to play with, uh, with, with neural nets, because most uh, neural net frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, and others actually do this automatically for you. So they give you kind of a library of modules that you can interconnect in different uh, types of graphs. And... Uh, as long as you specify the, the the graph or the function to compute the output, they will automatically figure out how to compute the gradient for you. So that's the automatic differentiation uh, idea. Um, now, the next question you might ask is, uh, uh, how you going? What structure are you going to give to those networks? Because if you want to recognize images, uh, even a sort of relatively low resolution image is going to have maybe uh, you know, 200 pixels by 200 pixel resolution, that's 40,000 pixels, that's 120,000 variables if you have a color image. And uh, if you're going to multiply this by a matrix, one dimension of the matrix is going to be 120,000. The other dimension might be even larger. So there's going to be a very large matrix. And it's kind of becomes sort of impractical. So a lot of the game of deep learning today is figuring out good architectures, which means sparse matrices, sort of structures of sparse matrices, so that not all connections are, um, uh, are used. And uh, one idea that goes back a long time is the idea of getting a little bit of inspiration from the visual cortex or the auditory cortex, the architecture of the cortex in the brain of mammals, and uh, realize uh, this is classic work in neuroscience from the 60s by Hubel and Weasel, Nobel Prize winning, uh, quickly realize that neurons in the visual cortex are not connected to all the um, uh, optical nerve fibers, they're only connected to a very small number of them that are uh, all neighbors, if you want. So that's the idea of a local receptive field. And then neighboring neurons in the visual cortex uh, view sort of neighboring patches in the, uh, in the input field, in the, in the visual field. And then each uh, particular patch in the um, individual field is, is looked at by a number of different uh, neurons. Um, uh, Huber and Weasel call them simple cells. The response to simple cells are then aggregated to build a little bit of shift invariance to the to the representation. This idea was uh, uh, turned into a computer model by Kuni Fukushima in the early 80s um, with a model called the Cognitron and Neocognitron. Uh, it didn't have the idea of backprop uh, at the time, so uh, his training was kind of using some sort of competitive unsupervised running. And my contribution to this in the uh, late 80s was to basically build a, a model of this type that uh, was trained with backpropagation. Uh, that's what we call a convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network um, here, um, represented here as an input image. Um, at the bottom right, what you see is an input image with a particular uh, unit. Uh, I don't dare calling them neurons. A unit that looks at a 5 by 5 neighborhood, uh, uh, sorry, a 7 by 7 neighborhood on the previous layer. And uh, basically computes the dot product of the pixels within this five, uh, seven by seven neighborhood uh, with a, a patch of, uh, of weights coefficients represented uh, by the little square here in, in between the two images. And uh, this um, uh, this patch uh, has positive and negative weights. And basically, you can think of it as a template that will cause the output neuron to turn on or turn off depending on whether the uh, motif that it looks at kind of matches uh, well uh, its, its pattern. Um, so the first layer of a convolutional net has a, a number of th those different filters. The coefficients would be learned. They're not being determined by hand. They are initial, initially set randomly. And then we use backpropagation to just learn them. So in this uh, particular instance here of the neural net on the top left, you see uh, four feature maps, which correspond to uh, the, the uh, application of four filters to the, to the image. Um, and this operation that I just described, um, uh, what I should mention is that um, neighboring neurons in, uh, or neighboring units in one of those uh, feature maps uh, look at uh, neighboring patches um, uh, shifted by one pixel in this case, but they use the same weights. They all use the same weights. 
what that means is that the, all the units are constrained to extract the same feature on different parts of the image, which means that if the system learns to detect a particular feature because it, it happened to appear in the lower left, it will actually have a detector for it everywhere in the visual field. Um, this is not inspired by biology. Obviously, uh, biology doesn't do this, but uh, it accelerates learning uh, quite a lot. Uh, the second layer is what's called uh, in the neuroscience complex cells. So they, those units basically aggregate the response of the output of the, the, the filtering unit, which uh, have been passed with nonlinearity here. And then the result is subsampled, which means the resolution of the output images here is half the resolution of the, the feature maps. Um, and that uh, uh, causes the system to have a little bit of uh, shift invariance, uh, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, the next layer up is, again, a convolution. But this one, but this one uses multiple filters applied to the different feature maps and adds up the result, passes the result to a nonlinearity. And then it goes on to uh, pooling and subsampling uh, operation disaggregation, co uh, complex cell uh, equivalent. You can stack multiple alternate uh, layers of this type, convolution, nonlinearity, pooling, convolution, nonlinearity, pooling. And that's how you build a, a, a convolutional net. As you go up the layers, the, res the spatial resolution diminishes, and generally the number of feature maps increases um, to kind of keep the richness of the representation. So here is an example of a uh, convolutional net in action. It's been trained to recognize handwritten digits. Um, it's from the early 90s. And what you see is the response. Every pixel here is a response of a particular neuron in a, in a layer. Um, so when uh, the input shifts by two pixels in the second layer, after pooling and subsampling, it shifts by one pixel. And after another couple layers, it shifts by one half pixel, whatever that means. And then as you go up the layers, the shift is reduced. Uh, when you get to the, the, the top layer here, which is not really the top layer, it's the, it's the layer right before the output, uh, not showing the output, the representation transforms in, in, in relatively simple ways whenever the input uh, uh, the pattern is shifted. And that makes the system sort of deal with uh, variation in position, size, and orientation of the, of the input pattern. Um, this is a, uh, an old video. Um, this is a younger version of myself here that you see on the right. And I'm putting a, my phone number at Homedale, the Bell Labs location in Homedale, New Jersey. It doesn't work anymore. I hit a key. The camera grabs an image. And it goes through one of those convolutional nets. And it recognizes uh, the, uh, the entire thing. Um, this uh, uh, the system was uh, eventually built into a check recognition system, which was uh, commercialized by uh, an AT&T subsidiary called NCR back in 1994-1995. By the end of the 90s, the system was reading between 10 and 20 percent of all the checks in the U.S. Um, but by that time, the the machine learning community had uh, lost interest in neural nets for complicated reasons that I might go into in the question set, uh, session, if you want. Pretty quickly, we realized we could use those networks to recognize multiple objects simultaneously. So not just recognize a single object, but we could essentially slide the neural net over an entire image that may uh, contain multiple objects and would basically get a, a sequence, a series of answers on the output, uh, which for each possible position of the convolutional net on the input would produce a, a guess for the output. And then we could sort of post-process this to uh, interpret it. That turned out to be really important for uh, applications in uh, sort of real uh, natural images uh, where the, the image is uh, on the background. So for example, you want to train a neural net, a convolutional net, to detect faces or detect pedestrians. Um, you, 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 you train it on tons of images that have either an a face or not a face in it. And it learns to classify that. And then you can uh, apply the neural net at multiple scales to uh, a large image with a sliding window, which is, by the way, very efficient to, uh, to do with a convolutional net. And you get a, uh, a detector this way. Um, and so that the, this ability to basically distinguish uh, in, uh, figure from ground or multiple objects from each other uh, is, uh, is crucially important. Um, in the mid 2000s, we started working on a, on a project in mobile robotics using uh, convolutional net. The idea was to essentially uh, drive a robot in nature off road and use a convolutional net to label all the pixels in an image as to whether each pixel is tra a traversable area that the, the robot can drive on or not. And the, the beauty of this is that uh, the data didn't have to be labeled manually. We basically run the, the robot around and then use a stereo vision system to figure out if a particular pixel in the, 
uh, image sticks out of the ground or is, it, or is, is on the ground, um, and then use that to train the neural net. So you say, why train a neural net if you already have a stereo system? The problem with the stereo system is that it only works up to about 10 meters, and you need to be able to have uh, long-range vision if you want to be able to plan a trajectory, particularly if you have, uh, this is short-range vision here, if you have pesky grad students jumping in front of the robot. Um, and so um, that allowed the, the neural net, basically, the, the system to really do long-range planning and sort of identify passages, like, like, uh, like in this case here. Um, a very similar idea, a couple of years later, this is around 2009, 2010, uh, uh, we, we were able to train a convolutional net and even implement it in specialized hardware on an FPGA uh, to label every pixel in an image, not as to whether it's traversable or not, but whether it's let's say the road, the sidewalk, the buildings, the trees, the cars, the pedestrians, et cetera. Um, this, is far from, this system was far from perfect. Those uh, techniques have made a huge amount of progress in recent years uh, using essentially very similar uh, ideas. Um, and um, uh, you know, it, it classifies patches of, uh, of this uh, as desert. This is the middle of Manhattan, actually. So there's no desert I'm aware of there. Uh, this is right in the middle of NYU campus. Um, but it does a decent job, um, and we could run this at about uh, 20 frames per second on, a, on an FPGA at the time. So this is about 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of people kind of realize this could be used for autonomous driving. So a lot of autonomous driving systems today use techniques very similar to this one to basically figure out what is the distance to the closest obstacle, where can I drive, uh, where, you know, where is the nearest car, things like that. Um, but all of this was kind of relatively obscure until around 2012, 2013, when, uh, uh, or 2010, I should say, when deep learning started um, uh, really sort of um, attracting the attention of the speech recognition community. And within uh, just a couple of years, uh, speech recognition system went from uh, not using neural nets at all to all using neural nets, uh, including mobile on mobile devices. So the lowering of error rate that you've seen in, uh, in speech recognition system is due to deep learning. Modern uh, speech recognition systems actually are almost entirely based on deep learning from beginning to end. Uh, th there's almost no kind of separate uh, pre-processing or post-processing now. But, uh, but what, what everybody talked about was the revolution of 2000, late 2012 when our friends at University of Toronto under, under Jeff Hinton uh, managed to train a very large neural net on uh, a GPU, a couple of GPUs. They, they, you know, people before had, had um, trained uh, convolutional nets on GPUs, but they, theirs were really, really big, much bigger than what was done before. It had about a billion uh, uh, connections, if you want. And they were able to uh, get really good results on ImageNet. That result is very well known. Uh, so ImageNet is a data set with uh, 1.3 million training samples, 1,000 categories. Um, and they, they got much better results than previous uh, state of the art that uh, was about 25 uh, or 26% error, top five, which means uh, if the correct answer is not in the top five that the system proposes, then it's counted as a mistake. So they uh, produced a system that had 16% error, and over the subsequent years, people reduced this to less than 3%, which is basically above human performance on this data set. Um, what happened is that the number of layers of those convolutional nets increased dramatically. Um, as years pass by, and now kind of a standard workhorse of sort of production image recognition is what's called the ResNet architecture. So it's a convolutional net. It has convolutions and nonlinearities. It has pooling, um, but it also has skipping connections. So what you see here is those, uh, those little arcs. Those are connections that basically skip pairs of layers. And uh, the, the advantage of this is that if a pair of layer happens to die because the optimization isn't working properly, then there is at least uh, uh, you know, some possibility for the information to, uh, to go through and, and to not uh, kind of destroy the, the functionality of the entire network. So uh, this is a very uh, uh, sort of typical type architecture now that's used a lot for, by a lot of people. And there's you know, all kinds of variations, more, more recent variations of this now. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, of, of them. Uh, this is a chart that was produced by uh, Alfredo Conziani, who is a postdoc with me at NYU. And uh, the, it shows on the x-axis the number of billion operations to compute a single output for um, uh, convolutional nets of, of different architectures. On the y-axis, the top one accuracy on ImageNet. The record at the moment is 84% uh, roughly, which is a little higher than anything you see on this chart. Um, 
But, uh, but what you see is that there's a wide variety of different architectures um, where people are trying to push for finding the minimal architecture that gives the maximum performance, because that's what you want if you want to push things into production at scale. Um, yeah, well, um, I forgot to say, uh, it's important, for example, for Facebook, where um, users of Facebook upload billions of images on Facebook per day, and each of those images goes through half a dozen uh, different convolutional nets within two seconds of being uploaded. So it's a lot of volume. Uh, the same is true for video and things like this. What's happened over the last few years is that we went from being able to identify the dominant uh, uh, object in an image to being able to draw the outline of a number of objects, uh, figure out the body pose of human uh, bodies, but also now we can actually identify every background object and everything. So a technique that has uh, attracted a lot of attention is uh, called Max, Mask RCNN, uh, originally by Ross Gershik and then uh, by a bunch of uh, 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 cast of character at Facebook AI Research in uh, Menlo Park. Uh, and it's kind of a two-stage uh, detection system that sort of identifies regions of interest and then feeds that to a second neural net that sort of picks out the objects in the image. Um, there's a, a, another approach, um, which is done by the same people, actually, called a uh, feature pyramid network, uh, retina net. And it's uh, a convolutional net followed by what you could call a deconvolutional net, which produces uh, an image on the output with multiple planes of the same size of the input image, which contains a mask of every instance of every object on the image. So this, go this does uh, instance segmentation. So this is the kind of uh, result it produces. It can tell you um, here is a person, and here is the outline of the person. Here is a wine glass. Here is a table. I don't see the whole table, but I can draw the outline of what I see. There's a computer in the back, etc. It can identify, you know, it can distinguish individual sheep from this uh, uh, pack of sheep, uh, and you know, distinguish cars that are partially occluded. Uh, and all of this is open source. You can just download this from this GitHub, and um, um, you know, play with it. There is a number of pre-trained networks as well that you can uh, obtain uh, and run on PyTorch. Um, more recent work by the same team uh, uh, performs what's called panoptic um, vision, which means to not only recognize every instance of every object but, and, and draw the outline, but also recognize regions that are in the background, so like the grass or the, the, the road, the, the, the beach, the, the sea, et cetera. And so this basically does, uh, you know, labels every pixel in the image, whether it's an object or kind of a region, if you want. Uh, it's very recent work. It appeared uh, uh, only a few months ago. Um, so people have been using those techniques for all kinds of really cool applications. One of the hottest topics uh, currently in medical imaging is actually the use of convolutional nets for uh, detecting uh, ailments or, I mean, various uh, lesions in, uh, uh, in medical images. And one of the advantages of, of those over human vision is that they can take into account the entire 3D volume of the image, because uh, you can make the input of the convolutional net a 3D array instead of just a 2D array. And so it can sort of look at the entire image altogether without having to go through slices to make sense out of it. Um, uh, this type of architecture, which is basically a convolutional net followed by a deconvolutional net, which kind of has the sort of reverse architecture, is sometimes called, uh, called a U-net for obvious reasons here. It has the shape of a U. Uh, and it's got kind of skipping connections, a little bit like, like the ResNet idea. Uh, and this is very popular for medical imaging. So this is an example of a result. Uh, this is actually done on 3D images, but it sort of segments the, the, the femur, um, which is important if you want to do hip replacement. Um, it can do things like highlight uh, uh, tumors, benign or, or, or uh, benign tumors in uh, mammograms. This is, these are a pair of 2D images. Uh, these are work that are done at NYU, by the way. Um, there's some work also in collaboration by uh, NYU and Facebook on accelerating the process of collecting images from MRI uh, by using one of those networks to basically fill in the blanks of the information that's missing to make it palatable by, uh, by doctors. There's enough information there that all the details will actually be there, but uh, you have to make it look nice. And so that's what this does. This uh, can reduce the time it takes to take an MRI by about a factor of six, and that will reduce the, the cost of an MRI exam. So there's lots of applications of, um, of, of convolutional nets. And I, as I was saying, every single autonomous driving project to, today uses convolutional net one way or another. Uh, the example you see here at the top right is uh, some early work of uh, Mobileye 
that uh, use uh, essentially semantic segmentation to kind of identify traversable areas, very much like the robotics project I was telling you about earlier. NVIDIA is very active in this area as well. Um, now, here is a limitation of deep learning. Uh, current systems are very good for perception. They're not so great for reasoning. And so there is a lot of work on basically trying to figure out architectures of uh, neural nets that will allow those systems to learn to reason, uh, uh, sort of you know do a kind of a sequence of reasoning if you want, or answer complex questions that require kind of examining uh, an image or, or, or a piece of data. Um, so one idea for reasoning that you need to have is the idea that a system has to have some sort of working memory so that um, if a system, for example, reads a text, it needs to remember what's in the text and it needs to kind of store the representation of the meaning of the text into some sort of memory that it can, that it can sort of work on, it can access and perhaps even modify. Um, if, you have, if you're going to have a, a chain of reasoning, uh, there is a number of facts that you kind of maintain in your working memory and then as as you do a step of inference, you sort of add facts or remove facts from your, from, from your memory. So uh, that gave the idea to a bunch of people, in particular at Facebook, uh, around 2014, of what's called a memory network. And the memory network is basically a neural net to which you attach another type of neural net, which is designed to be an associative memory. Uh, and the way this works, you can think of it if you, are, if you know anything about uh, uh, electronic circuit design, particularly for uh, circuit design for RAM, is basically a soft RAM, if you want, where an input address comes in. The address is really a vector. That vector is compared using Euclidean distance with a bunch of key vectors. You could think of it as of this whole thing as an address decoder. And then the scores that come out, which are those dot products, are fed to a softmax that transforms all those numbers uh, to numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. You use those numbers as coefficients to compute the weighted sum of a bunch of value vectors. So what you get is a weighted sum of the value vectors, and that's the output of the memory. If uh, the input address matches only one of the vectors and all the other ones are orthogonal, then you will only get the corresponding value vector out, which is really the behavior of a, of a RAM, essentially, um, or an associative memory more generally. And so there, there's sort of a lot of really interesting work in this area, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, the concept has been rescaled, uh, uh, re um, recycled in the context of something called um, a transformer network. So a transformer network is uh, essentially a, a, a type of multi-layer neural net where every group of units in every layer is essentially behaves like one of those uh, memories uh, with a little bit more complexity. Um, and people call this uh, self-attention. So this is basically a way for uh, a neural net, a particular group of, of units, to not have a fixed set of weights, but basically those weights are influenced by the context, by, by the input and by other things that uh, uh, might be happening next, uh, next to that. Um, this is the type of network that is very widely used in natural language processing, particularly uh, for translation. And uh, um, um, a particular, sim particularly simple example of this is called dynamic convolution. This is the favorite model of people working on translation here at uh, Facebook. Um, here's another example. This is uh, also work coming out of Facebook uh, in Menlo Park in collaboration with um, uh, people at uh, Georgia Tech and Stanford, uh, which is a neural net that whose output is not an answer, but is itself a neural net, and that neural net is designed to produce an answer. So let's say the problem you're facing is that you show a system an image like the one at the bottom left, and uh, and then you tell it a sentence, there is a shiny object that is right to the gray metallic cylinder. Does it have the same size as a large rubber sphere? Um, so basically, uh, there's, there's no way a, a, a fixed architecture neural net can answer this question. So what happens here is that there is a, a neural net that analyzes the sentence, and then it produces a network of uh, modules, each of which, uh, the, and, and this, this entire network is basically a new neural net that um, uh, hopefully will be able to answer the question. And all of those modules are trainable. Uh, so you, you train the entire system here to produce a, the, the network of uh, modules and to train the modules to do the right thing um, on a large number of question and answers. And uh, this works surprisingly well. There's uh, a number of different work here uh, on this type of topic, in particular also by Aaron Corville at University of Montreal. Very interesting. So this is the idea of a dynamic uh, neural net. It's not a fixed architecture. It's kind of dynamically determined by another neural net. Um, in fact, that led people to think that uh, perhaps the, the, a new way of programming that some people have called software 2.0 is uh, 
you, you write a program that specifies the architecture of a neural net. And this program may have uh, conditionals, it may have loops. And so it may, and it may be the producing a neural net whose architecture is data dependent. So it's never the same neural net that is being produced depending on the input. So it's really a program in the end. But the function of each of the instructions of that program is basically a differentiable module that is, whose function is controlled by a bunch of parameters. And the overall function of the system is not completely determined until you train it on, uh, on some data. Um, so that's kind of uh, you know, a new way, if you want, of uh, building systems that uh, analyze data. And those dynamic neural nets are uh, kind of uh, handled at, at a, a very deep level by uh, frameworks like PyTorch and Chainer. OK, but obviously we're missing something. How is it that humans can learn to recognize you know, young children? You show them two pictures of an elephant, and, um, and then they know what an elephant is. Uh, you step into a car and you practice for about 20 hours and you'll probably never crash within these 20 hours, although you will hesitate, you'll drive slowly. But within 20 or 30 hours of training, you'll be able to drive the car. How is it that humans can do this and machines can't? There's obviously something very fundamental that we're missing with current crops of machine learning that humans and animals uh, seem to be able to do. And so uh, one question we might ask is, you know, wh what do we learn in the first few months of life? And I'm talking about babies here, but uh, it's true of uh, young animals as well. So for example, if you, if you show a young baby uh, the scenario where there's a little car on a platform here on the top left, and then the car is pushed off the platform, and it appears to float in the air, and it doesn't fall, a six-month-old baby will not even pay attention to it. Um, it was, you know, that's just another thing that happens in the world that it needs to learn about. Um, nothing surprising about it. A nine-month-old baby will go like the little girl at the bottom left. Uh, she'll be extremely surprised because in the meantime, around eight, nine months, babies learn about gravity. They realize that objects are not supposed to float in the air. They're supposed to, to fall if they're not supported. And so that happens kind of spontaneously. Nobody tells the baby that objects are supposed to fall. Uh, the babies are not, don't, don't have a huge amount of motor control. So a lot of, it, a lot of what they learn about the world is through observation. So one, one might ask, what is it that we learn by observation? And this is a chart that was put together by um, uh, Emmanuel Dupou, who is a cognitive neuroscientist uh, in Paris, uh, who spends part of his time at Facebook. And he's going to try to figure out at what age babies learn things like object permanence, the fact that an object, uh, even if you don't see it anymore, is still there. You know, it might be just hidden by another one. The fact that some objects can, um, you know, are stable, some other will fall. Uh, the fact that objects uh, fall with gravity and there is inertia and things like this. So that appears around nine months. Um, and it, it looks like babies learn this by observation. And I think one of the big obstacles to making true progress in AI is to figure out paradigms of learning that would allow machine to learn uh, you know, the same way, essentially. Uh, because babies accumulate an enormous amount of background knowledge about the world using this type of observational uh, learning. Um, and it's not just babies. Uh, here's a baby orangutan. He's being shown a magic trick where an object is put in a, in a cup, and then the object is removed, but it doesn't see that, and then the cup is empty. And this baby orangutan is really surprised and rolls on the floor laughing. Um, he, he obviously has a model of the world that integrates uh, object permanence. He knows objects are not supposed to disappear like this. So how, do, how does that happen? How do animals and humans uh, uh, learn this? So my proposal to this, and it's just a proposal, is uh, what I call self-supervised learning, which you can think of as a form of unsupervised learning. Um, and the idea is to train a very large neural network to understand the world through prediction. And it's not a new idea. A lot of people have proposed this idea of learning to understand the world by prediction uh, going back many decades. That, that includes Jeff Hinton, um, you know, going back 40 years almost. Um, so let's say, for the sake of simplicity here, that uh, what, uh, what we're trying to predict, the, the input to the system is a, a piece of video, a video clip. And we're going to show the, uh, a segment of the video to the system, and we're going to ask it to predict what's going to happen next. To be able to make that prediction, the system has to understand a lot about how the world works. And that's the basic idea of, uh, of self-supervised learning. So there's no external human-provided labels. You use part of the input to supervise the system to predict um, uh, the rest of the input, essentially. Um, and if you, uh, oops, um, now 
the amount of information that you ask the machine to predict in that scenario is really enormous because you're asking it to predict a whole bunch of video frames, which is an enormous amount of information. It's much more than the amount of information they would provide the machine or ask it to predict in supervised learning. In supervised learning, you only ask the machine to predict a category, which is maybe a few bits of information. And it's enormously more than in reinforcement learning because in reinforcement learning, the only th thing you tell the machine is you got it right, you got it wrong, and here is by, by how much. This is what people call the reward or the value, uh, uh, the, the, the value really. So uh, inevitably, the more information you give to the system for every trial, the fewer trial is gonna need to uh, learn uh, something in particular. The main issue with self-supervised learning is, not, is that it's not task directed. It's some learning that you do beforehand, and then you have to do another directed learning, supervised or, or reinforcement, to actually learn a, a new skill. But, but you will rely on the uh, representation learned during the self-supervised learning phase. So that led me to this uh, slightly obnoxious analogy that if uh, machine learning intelligence or AI is a, is a cake, the vast majority of the bulk of the cake, if you want, is self-supervised learning. Everything that we learn as humans, almost everything, is learned through self-supervised learning. There's a thin layer that we learn through supervised learning and a tiny amount that we learn through reinforcement learning, and that's the cherry on the cake, essentially. Um, so the next revolution in AI will not be supervised. This is a slogan that was originally proposed by Alyosha Efros from uh, University of California at Berkeley, and I stole it from him, and since then, uh, people put it on T-shirts, so you can actually buy the T-shirt. Um, now, um, self-supervised learning actually works today. It's very practical for uh, natural language processing. So how do you do this for natural language processing? And you may have heard of models uh, with the nice names like BERT. Uh, so, and there's you know, a whole family of those, of those models. The way you train those models is that you show it a piece of text, uh, perhaps a window of a few hundred words, maybe a thousand words. And what you do is that you mask 15 or 20% of those words, you just take them out. You, you replace them by kind of a blank token if you want. And then you train a neural net called an autoencoder whose output is the same size as the input. You train it to predict the words that are missing. Uh, and by training very large transformer neural nets using those self-attention mechanisms, uh, with this process, you get an internal representation learned by the system, which is very, very good. You can look, you can use this uh, internal representation for a whole bunch of different natural language processing tasks, including translation, and beat the record of performance uh, uh, on, on, on all of those tasks. And so those are enormous models that require a lot of uh, compute power and time and data to, to train, but it's unable data. Uh, so that's really a big success. It doesn't work so well for images. So there are attempts at doing similar things for images where you mask a piece of the image and you ask the system to kind of reconstruct the missing parts. And those have not been as successful, unfortunately. They um, uh, they, they, they sort of uh, help a little bit if you don't have a lot of uh, label samples, but they don't improve the performance on ImageNet, for example. Um, so, uh, but for NLP, it's really a big success, and uh, I think we're going to see a lot of progress in this area uh, over the next, uh, the next few years. Um, it works partly for, uh, for speech recognition, but, uh, but let me sp skip ahead and say, why is it that it works for natural language processing and not so much for images or video? And the reason I believe is because uh, uh, text is discrete and the prediction cannot be made exactly. You can um, uh, easily represent a distribution over words by a large vector of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. Um, it's called softmax, uh, the function that produces that. And, and, and those BERT system, basically, that's how they handle uncertainty. They, they, they produce a probability vector over the, the, the words that are, that are masked. It's much more difficult to do this in the case of continuous uh, 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 data because we don't have good ways of parameterizing probability distributions over high, di high dimensional continuous spaces of images, for example. Um, and so how to handle uncertainty there is not clear. Uh, we have to find new methods. Um, and it was due to the fact that, for example, if you, uh, if you have a system that does video prediction and you train it on all kinds of videos, you get, you get the kind of, um, let's say you plug a convolutional net on a few frames of video and train it to predict the next few frames with least square. What you get are blurry predictions. So this is what you see here at the bottom left. The little girl is uh, blowing uh, the candles for, for her birthday. Uh, but the predictions produced by the system after the first few frames are, are really blurry, and it's because the system doesn't really know what's going to happen, so it predicts the average of all the possible future scenarios, and that's a blurry image. 
uh, if you imagine that I put a, a pen on the table and I let it go, it's going to, you know, every time I repeat the experiment, it's going to fall in a different direction. And so if I have to make one prediction, I'm going to predict the average, which is basically a, a, a sort of superposition of a transparent pen or, you know, over all possible angles. It's not a good, a good prediction. Um, but using something called adversarial training, you can actually make the results much better. Um, and I'll come to this in a minute. So adversarial training for video prediction is the idea that you're going to train a predictor, this G function here, that takes the past frames, uh, the x variable, and it's going to take an extra set of variables uh, called latent variables um, to, in such a way that when we vary those latent variables, the output varies over all the possible future predictions. Okay. Now, the problem with this is that uh, to train, to be able to train this machine, you, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to sample the, the z variable at random. And there is no way that the result is going to be exactly the one that we observe in the video because we, we draw this variable at random. And so what we need now is we need uh, something that tells us that the prediction is on the right uh, set of, uh, on, on this red ribbon here, which is a set of plausible prediction. And the problem is that we're going to need to train a second neural net to do this. And so that's the idea of uh, adversarial training. You have a generator that makes a prediction, and you have a discriminator that basically is trained to tell whether the prediction is good or not. And the discriminator is trained with real, the real data, is trained to say, yeah, that's good. And on the, the ones produced by the generator is trained to say, that's bad. And the generator, getting the gradient back from the discriminator, trains itself to produce outputs that will fool the discriminator into thinking uh, they are good predictions. Um, so as the generator trains itself, its prediction, the green dot here at the right, get closer to the blue dots, which you can think of as the um, as, as the, the training points, and the discriminator learns a contrast function that basically says how far you are from the from the manifold of uh, correct data. So the green dot eventually move, and then the generator basically mimics the, the real world. Um, this kind of technique is uh, can produce amazing results in image generation. So here there is no conditioning, there is no past. You just put, put a, a bunch of random numbers to a neural net, and it produces images of people that don't exist. This was trained on a uh, data set of uh, images of celebrities, and these are non-existing celebrities, basically invented by one of those uh, generators. Uh, you can train it on uh, clothing, and then it will generate new prints for dresses and things like this. If you train it on the collection of famous designers, um, and you know, for video prediction of various kinds, um, it's it's a good idea to do video prediction in the context of self-driving cars because you might want to know in advance what other cars on the streets are going to do. Uh, so this is a, a video prediction system trained in the space of the output of a semantic segmentation system or uh, instant segmentation system that uh, draws the outline of every, uh, every car in the scene. Uh, this is work by um, uh, Pauline Luc and Camille Coupri in Paris, uh, at, at Facebook in Paris. Uh, let me skip ahead a little bit because we're running out of time. Uh, I want to uh, only talk about um, the, the last thing I want to talk about is a uh, self-supervised forward model, uh, learning a control tax with very few interactions. So this is the idea of using forward models, predictive forward models, uh, to allow systems to kind of uh, speed up the learning without too many interactions with the real world. So um, uh, here, is a, here is the problem. The problem is that we like to train a car to drive itself on a highway, and we like to take into account, uh, we like to take advantage of the fact that we can put cameras um, uh, watching highways and observe uh, actual drivers' behavior and then use this to kind of predict what cars around us uh, are going to do. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take one particular car here in this, uh, in this image, uh, the bottom image, and we're going to extract a little rectangle of all the cars around it, and that's its surrounding. You can think of the state of the world to, from the point of view of this car as this little rectangle of all the cars around it. And what we're going to do is train a neural net given a few frames of the environment of a particular car. The car is moving, but we keep it at the center of this rectangle. Um, and we look at what the cars around it are doing. And we train a neural net to predict um, what's going to happen in the future, what, that, what the cars around it are going to do. Uh, and that might allow it to kind of plan in advance how to drive uh, to, uh, so as to avoid uh, accidents. Now, if you do this with a completely deterministic system without uh, latent variable, you get the result which is on the second column here. So the second column here is a predictor that predicts in the absence of latent variable is completely deterministic. And the result is that it makes blurry prediction, which are not really good. If you add a latent variable with a technique that I don't have time to describe, 
which is basically akin to what's called a variational autoencoder, uh, you get very crisp predictions. And each of the four columns that you see on the right here are different predictions made by different random sampling of that latent variable. And so this thing is able to predict multiple futures that are all plausible. Now, what you can do is, uh, now that you have a model of the world, they can predict the next state of the world, which is the environment of the car, from the previous state. You can feed it an action, which is uh, a steering wheel and acceleration braking, um, and then see what happens and measure the cost, how far your car is to the other cars, is it in lane, things like that. And you can run this uh, multiple time steps. This is kind of a simulation of what's going on in the, in the world in your head, if you want. This is not the real world. It's a simulation in your head. And then by backpropagation, you can train a neural net, the Pi network here at the bottom, which uh, is called a policy network, to produce an action that will uh, uh, minimize the cost, which means minimize the expectation of a, a collision in the long run. Uh, this is not reinforcement learning. There is no reinforcement learning whatsoever here. It's, uh, it's purely gradient descent. Everything is differentiable, and everything goes on uh, inside of the machine. Um, and uh, let me just give you the punchline. So here is an example of the result. Here, the, the yellow car is the actual car uh, in the collected data. And the blue car is the car being driven by our agent. And what you have to realize is that that blue car is invisible to all the other ones, because the other ones are, have recorded trajectory. And so they don't see that blue car. Uh, here is another example. Um, and so that system is basically learned to drive on a highway without hitting other car, without being hit by other car. Um, by basically imagining what could happen in the future and then train a policy that will minimize the likelihood of uh, accidents. Um, I'm going to end here. Um, we don't have much time left for questions, I'm afraid, uh, and I'm sorry about that. But um, uh, let's go to questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, we'll take. We'll have time for a couple questions. So uh, maybe we'll start with uh, the question a question on explainability. So. Uh, a couple people have wondered, actually, that explainability seems to be a pretty important thing for machine learning models. And they're wondering, how might you approach that with deep learning, um, and how important do you think it is? OK, any question? Thanks very much, John. Uh, did you hear the question on explainability? Okay, I'm not or should I repeat it? Here. Marin, are you still around? I'm here. Hi, can you hear me? my apologies. Okay, I see the question, so I'm going to answer a few questions if I can until we cut off, I guess. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Jan, see. can you hear me? Uh, do I see a future for capsule networks? Uh, so capsule networks are uh, an idea from Jeff Hinton, a uh, uh, dear uh, longtime friend of mine and, and collaborators. Of course, we uh, received the Turing Award together. Uh, I think capsule is a very cool idea. It's basically a way, um, you can think of it as a way of replacing the, the pooling layers in convolutional nets by something a little more sophisticated that takes into account geometry. Uh, the problem with it, currently is that it works on small uh, problems like MNIST and things like that. It doesn't work so well on large scale systems and there is sort of issues of implementations with TensorFlow and things like this. So it's not entirely clear that it's gonna pan out. Uh, it might take a few more years. It's an interesting idea. I mean, it's a new architecture, you know, it's a bit like Transformer. Uh, it, it's not just a complete new way of doing deep learning. It's kind of a new architecture within the framework of deep learning. A lot has been said about this that is not entirely um, entirely clear. Uh, other question. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Hi, Jan. Uh, Jan, can you hear me? Okay, here's a funny question. If we use the thesis in statistics that the probability of something that has never happened is equal to zero, how do we expect AI, which uses statistics uh, as its inference uh, engine, to participate, to anticipate the future? Um, yeah, okay, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a little limiting to think that machine learning necessarily just does uh, probabilistic statistics. There's a lot of systems that are based on probabilistic frameworks, but a lot of models that I use are actually not entirely based on 
those kinds of assumptions. So I'm a big fan of what, what, I'm call, what I call energy-based models. In an energy-based model, if you, um, the, the, the energy basically gives a score to different outcomes. And the score is, uh, is an energy, not a probability. So um, a, a likely event will have a low energy and unlikely event will have a high energy. And nothing can have a completely zero probability in this case because, because nothing can have an infinite energy. Energies are, are finite numbers. And so that corresponds to kind of the same situation as in physics where, um, where nothing can basically have zero probability. Um, but everything is a score. I, I, I think sometimes sticking to probabilistic framework is actually a little limiting. There is a, a wider word out there, world out there um, by, by using this sort of energy-based framework. Um, and I've, I've written a, a few papers on this, and a lot of what I do is kind of centers around this. Um, let's see. I'm going to keep going until they, sh they, they shut us down. We're, we're past the time here already, but I don't hear anybody from the... <laughs> Um, from from the moderators. Uh, let's see. Okay, about baby learning. Obviously, a lot of the abilities are not learned, but genetically built in. Uh, like they have built-in filters to recognize shapes. Can you comment, for example, of learned versus inherited inabilities? Yeah, this is a big debate. In fact, uh, one of that of those debates about language is what got me into machine learning in the first place. Um, uh, you know, it's the, the question of nature versus nurture. What is hardwired? What prior information is uh, is built into the brain? What uh, what do we learn? I think it is different for different species. So, uh, you know, obviously for a lot of uh, relatively simple animal, animals, a lot of it is hardwired. Uh, a lot of animals learn. Pretty much every animal can learn uh, to some degree. Uh, and uh, what, what the characteristic of uh, primates, uh, humans in particular, is that their brain is extremely flexible and takes a long time to develop. And so what you see here is a trade-off between, uh, you know, if you have a lot of prior information, you will need few samples to learn anything. So you will learn quickly. So if you are, I don't know, uh, you know, a baby giraffe, you have to learn to walk within minutes. Um, otherwise, you know, you're going to get eaten by a lion or something. Uh, uh, not necessarily for, for baby humans. Um, but then the more prior information there is, the less flexible you are, the less adaptive you are, which means uh, the more you are susceptible to uh, be hurt by changes in the environment, or, or, or you know, so so you know what's characteristic of human is that you know humans have colonized the entire planet because they're very adaptable. Uh, so you know it's a trade-off. Um, now, how much is hardwired in in babies is not entirely clear. Um, the idea, for example, that uh, oriented edge detectors in the primary visual cortex are hardwired may or may not be true. It may still be the result of learning, even though that learning may take place in the womb. Uh, the, the, the amount of real time it takes for any reasonable unsupervised learning algorithm to learn oriented edge detectors of the type that you see in V1 is in the order of minutes. And so it's basically impossible to tell um, you know, whether those things are learned or not. I mean, it would be crazy for nature not to learn those, given that they can be learned so quickly, so efficiently uh, within minutes of life. Um, what are some applications of dynamic neural nets either now or in the future? Uh, well, I think, you know, certainly in uh, reasoning, natural language processing, in things where uh, you want the system to be adaptable to every new situation. So you get into a room and you're supposed to do a task in that room. The, the model of the world that you have to build um, of the situation has to be dynamical in the sense that if you get to another room, it would be a different model. If, you get to, if you're facing another problem, it would be a different model. So I think there's a possibility that in the front part of our brain, we have some sort of configurable engine, if you want, that um, is uh, our, our sort of model of the world that we can configure to every particular situation. Uh, what is your view on analog circuit implementation of neural nets? Uh, I used to work on this a long time ago when I started at Bell Labs. Uh, all the group I joined was actually very focused on analog implementations of neural nets, and I participated in some of those projects. Uh, one in particular is called the ANA chip. Um, and I actually wrote a review paper on uh, sort of how hardware issues and, and, and the future of the trends, the current trends in AI and, and deep learning, and how they are relevant to uh, hardware designers. Uh, this is a, a paper uh, that went with a, a keynote speech at the ISSCC conference, uh, the IEEE Inter International uh, Solid State Circuit uh, Conference. 
Uh, and um, I talk about this there. Um, um, you know, it's not clear that analog is actually uh, really kind of worth um, uh, pursuing with current technology. It's it's not clear there is a big advantage in terms of power, for example, uh, over kind of more traditional digital implementation. On the other hand, uh, using exotic arithmetic representations, using architectures that can take advantage of sparsity of activations in neural nets and uh, dynamicity and things like this, um, I think uh, uh, should probably be done in the future. Uh, again, I, I don't have any information from the organizers, so I'm not entirely sure how long we can go on. <laughs> I think we passed the passed the time by a few minutes. Um, let's see. Let me see if I get any. Okay, uh, so they're telling me I um, I can go on for uh, a few minutes. I'll take a few more questions and then uh, and then I'll I'll wrap up. Um, so I have to go through the the questions one by one because let's see. Uh, there's a question. Um, about image generation and image reconstruction. So yes, the the, the problem of image uh, object detection, classification, segmentation in images is very well developed and works really well, as long as you have enough data. Um, but there is a new, very exciting uh, set of applications in image generation and um, uh, and reconstruction, which I mentioned also in my, in my talk. Um, I think this is a fascinating area, and certainly, uh, the, the new um, family of generative models that people have come up with in the last few years have really sort of brought a, a huge amount of progress in this area. So uh, uh, generative adversarial networks is, is one example. Uh, various other types of latent variable models like variational autoencoders and, uh, and, 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 and variations of this. Um, I think um, there's a very bright future for those models. I think they might be the ticket to solving the invariant, the, the, the dealing with uncertainty problem in, in predictive, predictive model that I, I talk, talked about earlier. Uh, so I, I personally work on this. I personally work on prediction under uncertainty using latent variable models. I'm trying to find alternative to GANs because GANs have stability problems. But, um, but that's really, I think, what is uh, uh, very promising for the future. And if we can solve the problem of uh, uh, kind of get machines to do self-supervised learning in the context of high dimensional continuous signals like, like video, uh, I think we'll have a tool that we can use now to make significant progress in AI, uh, perhaps get machines to learn abstract representations of the world without, without it being task directed. And in my opinion, that is the basis for common sense. So uh, common sense in animals and humans sort of emerges from the accumulation of vast amounts of knowledge about uh, uh, how the world uh, works. And uh, those models, I think, are the way to, uh, um, to do this. Uh, there's a remark on the fact that you can use simulation to test out uh, reinforcement learning system uh, so as to limit the number of real-world trials. Yeah, this is called sim to real So there are a lot of people who work for self-driving cars or robotic uh, grasping where they do all the training in simulation, which, of course, you can do faster than real time, and you can run in parallel on multiple machines. Uh, and then you kind of hope that that um, skill that has been learned in uh, simulation will transfer to the real world. It's not perfect. There is a few attempts there by uh, various people at, uh, at Berkeley, OpenAI, and uh, DeepMind, and Facebook also, actually, so various, uh, various places. I think the, the whole idea of having virtual environments where learning agents can interact is a good one. So there's a number of work along those lines um, uh, at Facebook uh, of 3D environments, like, you know, um, they look like, like houses, something like this, where an agent can move around and you can ask it questions and you can ask it to fetch an object and things like that. Um, for self driving cars, it's more difficult because the physics is actually very, very difficult to model. But, uh, but basically what I talked about at the end of my talk is really an example of this, where you train a predictive model of, uh, you don't have a simulator, but you train a predictive model by observation, and then you use this predictive model to train a policy network. This policy network basically has never seen the real world. It's only been trained with its own internal model of what can happen in the world. And then you can release it in the world, and it kind of works OK. Uh, you might need a little bit of RL on top of it to kind of fine tune it, but 
uh, that would be model based RL in that case. Um, so yeah, that's a perfectly legitimate uh, approach. I think ultimately though, um, it would be great if we could dispense with that. I mean, um, basically humans learn with an internal model, but this internal model is not a hand built simulator. It's more an internal model of the world that we have learned by observation. So very much like what I talked about at the end. Um, <clears throat> so it would be a temporary, uh, uh, a temporary thing if you want. Um, how powerful of a paradigm shift are graph convolutional networks, GCNs? I'm a big fan of graph, uh, uh, graph neural nets and graph convolutional nets in particular. I actually, I kind of co-authored the first paper on it. Um, I thought it was a really, really cool idea. Uh, there's a whole subfield now. So this is the idea, for those of you who don't know, th that you could, uh, you could define convolutional nets that operate not on uh, regular arrays of data, uh, you know, tensors, like uh, two-dimensional, two, three-dimensional, one-dimensional arrays, but they operate on functions on graphs. So think of an array as a, as a grid graph, as a grid, where each node is a pixel, for example, if it's an image. And you can think of an image as a function on this graph. And the neighborhood uh, relationship of the pixel is basically that graph. Now imagine that the graph is irregular. Can you define the notion of convolution? And in fact, you can. Um, there are uh, mathematically correct, but uh, computationally impractical ways of defining convolutions on, on graphs. And then there are kind of ways to cut corners that still work. I think it's a fascinating area. It opens the doors to a whole bunch of applications of deep learning in, uh, in, in chemistry, for example, in biology, in social networks, uh, in, in network analysis in, in general, in neuroscience, uh, in, in uh, genomics, you know, all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of areas. And I'm, I'm sort of very, very excited by this. I've actually organized workshops on this uh, in the past. Okay, I think uh, we've gone for probably too long already. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, end the session uh, here and thank you all for your attention. I apologize for going a little bit over time. And uh, I hope I uh, captured a good set of uh, representative questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Um, I hope that uh, everyone out there listening can hear. We just had some technical issues hearing internally. Um, this talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. And you can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Um, if you have a chance, please fill out the quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers. And you should also see, you should see that uh, on your screen. So on behalf of ACM, Jan Lacoon, and myself, Maron Sahami, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. This concludes the talk. Thanks very much.